It's July 19, 2024. This is the Room Now podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Jack Cush, executive editor of RoomNow.com. Let's begin with roll call. All right. Doctors Lou, Dr. Calabrese, Dr. Calabrese, Dr. Capolini, Dr. Bingham, Dr. Mira. Oh, this list? Yeah, this is a list of all the experts who taught me about IRAE, immune-related adverse events associated with checkpoint inhibitors. You know, we all see it. Not a lot of it, but we all see it. And it's good to have these experts out there teaching us. We had two reports on IRAEs this week that were synonymous. And these reports basically attested to the fact that when your patients with autoimmune disease get cancer and then are prescribed a checkpoint inhibitor, like a, a, a PD-1 um, LPD or PDL one antibody therapy or CKLA-4 uh, therapy, um, your adverse event rates are higher in your autoimmune patients. So one was a study uh, of one center, this was a stu- uh, published in PLOS, F- almost 500 patients that were going on anti-PD-1 um, or L1 or anti-CTLA-4 antibody therapy. And they found that amongst the 500 or so, that about 6% or 28 patients had pre-existing autoimmune disease. And when you compare those who had pre-existing autoimmune disease and the rates of IRAEs, which as you know, are psoriatic arthritis, myositis, you know, hypophysitis, IBD, et cetera, um, that IRAEs associated with these therapies were higher in the autoimmune patients, 57% of patients versus 35% in the non pre-existing autoimmune patients. Um, But interestingly, that um, autoimmunity did not have any, um, uh, was not affected by these IRAE events. And that was, I think, kind of interesting and good news. And outcomes and mortality were the same. Another was not a single center, but instead was a a meta-analysis, actually a systematic review of almost 24,000 patients. And the patients with autoimmune rheumatic disease had about 30% higher rate of IRAEs. Um, and that um, this was seen, and overall, a IRAEs were seen in 61% of patients with this. And that's kind of similar to the other one, 57%. Most of the, but the interesting point here is that most of the IRAEs are mild, maybe moderate, never life-threatening, not associated with death or really poor outcomes. The majority are treated with manageable doses of steroids and only a minority required either DMARD or biologic therapy. And more importantly, that um, this occurrence in uh, autoimmune patients with IRAEs had no effect on cancer outcomes. The treatment of the IRAE had no effect on the cancer response. Overall in that cohort, that uh, developed these IRAEs, 32% were hospitalized, mortality rate was incredibly low, 0.07%. So that's seven per 10,000. So very, very small. So again, I think this is particularly germane to us as rheumatologists who we do see these patients in consultation. Um, And you should know that um, maybe your patients who go and get these therapies may be at slightly higher risk. Uh, a new announcement this week that I think was expected, and that is AVI, based on the results of their successful trial of um, uh, upadacitinib in giant cell arteritis, has submitted regulatory applications to the FDA and the EMA to uh, for the consideration of upadacitinib in the treatment of adult patients with active uh, refractory giant cell arteritis. So that's the application has begun could be somewhere within a year before we see something positive on that or negative. We'll wait and see. Uh, An interesting study is a follow-up to last week. We talked about air pollution uh, causing higher rates of lupus. And as I mentioned, it's been associated with RA. This week, I got another one. This one from a fairly large, almost 500,000 UK biobank cohort found that uh, long-term exposure to air pollutants, and that was all kinds of nitrogen, nitrous, nitrous oxide kind of things, was associated with either anywhere from about a 20 to 50% increased risk of developing psoriasis. Um, moreover, those who had a genetic predisposition to psoriasis, I don't know what that is, what, CW6, um, uh, and were exposed had an even greater risk 
of incident psoriasis. So again, this unusual interplay, interplay and, and I think this is a big thing. I'm going to write soon an article about environmental rheumatology, and I think it's something we should be paying attention to. Um, two reports on methotrexate this week. We just love methotrexate in rheumatology, do we not? This is almost a 200-patient study where they actually studied uh, GI symptoms. Do you really need to do that? Well, they did it, and they did it formally using something called the methotrexate intolerance severity score, the MISS score. Uh, and they basically identified that amongst all these 192 patients with RA on methotrexate, GI intolerance of some sort was seen in 56%. Yes, you would have guessed that nausea um, and pain, I don't know what that is, occurred post-methotrexate. I'm not sure what that is. I think maybe they misclassified that, but I see 50% of people with CNS, blah, kind of things. Anyway, they did see that this was more in people with African-American descent, uh, in patients with fibromyalgia, those on steroids, those on JAK inhibitors. Interesting. Anyway, what they found was that the MISS score, the methotrexate intolerance severity score, was unrelated to the route of administration, oral versus IM. Prior or pre-existing GI disease, age or the methotrexate dose. I've always thought there might be an influence of dose on GI symptomatology. They showed at doses that are probably being used in RA, which I have to assume was as low as maybe seven and a half or 10, but as high as 25, that that range didn't seem to matter when it came to methotrexate toxicity of the GI type. Another study looked at methotrexate in, in patients not responding to methotrexate, 174 RA patients, and they, uh, and they were started on tocilizumab. And what was unique about this was having high GMCSF levels, uh, a sort of pro-inflammatory cytokine with a lot of hematologic inflammatory effects, high levels at baseline were an independent predictor of poor response to tocilizumab. Now, is this to say that, that it's the converse of uh, high IL-6 levels might be an indication of better responses to um, um, tocilizumab? No, it's not. And actually, high CRP levels and IL-6 levels has not been consistently shown to be predictive of responses here. But in this study, maybe this is a marker of more severe patients rather than patients who won't respond to tocilizumab specifically. So these patients um, also had higher DAS scores um, and had higher cytokine levels and SED rates uh, also at bedtime. So it might just be disease severity. But I like this kind of predictive variable research because we need more of that in knowing what therapy to choose next. A retrospective study looked at lupus nephritis and the influence of ankypositivity. We reported here before that there's a minority of patients with lupus, you know, and in this particular study, 30, uh, 115 patients had biopsy proven class 3, 4, or 5 lupus nephritis, and 30% were ANCA positive. In that cohort, ANCA positive lupus nephritis patients, they had higher disease activity scores. They had were more likely to have proliferative um, uh, 3 and 4 lupus nephritis, require more immunosuppressants in the form of cytoxan and mycophenolate, and they were um, um, actually... They were actually okay as far as achieving remission, but they did require those immunosuppressors, and they required more of them. So it might be a subset, uh, and you remember that research that was presented at by Andrea Fava from um, from Hopkins, where he showed PR3 staining in the kidney, and that it's PR3 staining that is exemplar is ex exemplifies the degranulation and the damage that goes on within the kidney. So it probably pays to check ANCA levels. And you probably should be worried about um, C ANCA and P ANCA. But again, there's enough reports out here that I'm changing my um, test ordering and staging of lupus, lupus patients, especially if I think they may have kidney involvement. Speaking of kidney involvement, can you give the urate lowering drug for Buxostat to patients who have chronic kidney disease? You know, the package insert says that you can, but it doesn't really talk about its use in the most severe forms of CKD, like CKD stage 3 or lower. Anyway, a meta-analysis of 16 studies showed that when febuxostat was used, um, it actually lowered the risk of future renal events, and it lowered the risk by 44%. 
these patients on febuxostat with gout, of course, had l slower rates of decline in their EGFRs. They had reduced urine albumin to creatinine ratios. So by controlling urate load, maybe it lessens urate-associated kidney disease or hypertension-related kidney disease, and the outcomes as far as kidney function are good. Still doesn't answer the question that I started this little diatribe with, which was, if you have high-level CKD, you know, can you safely use for Buxostat? And, and I would, um, unless they were on hemodialysis or aneuric, I would, I would just start at a lower dose and follow kidney function. But again, patients would, uh, again, creatinine clearances um, of 60 or higher, and uh, I, I would probably say even lower than that, certainly do well on febuxostat. Uh, I found this study kind of odd because I know nothing about it. Microwave ablation therapy. Uh, you know, they do cardiac ablation therapy and they do other ablation therapies. And this was a study being done uh, in a small cohort, 22 patients with 24 active knees who were presenting with chronic or recurrent monarthritis. So this is sort of an orthopedic study and patients with chronic monarthritis, not responsive to whatever you do in those people. And I know, don't know about you, but I've tried everything but the kitchen sink and they still recur. And it's a really tough group. Anyway, 24 knees treated with microwave ablation um, and they, uh, prior to the ablation, they required, I think, five um, intra-articular aspirations and or injections in the prior six months for a total of 129. In the six months following microwave ablation, only seven required intra-articular uh, aspirations without therapy. And the rates dropped from about one a month to 0.03 a month. And that was highly significant. No complication rates. Where do I get my microwave ablation therapy? Do I get it at Sears in the microwave department or do I call the crazy scientist orthopedist in town? I don't know. We need to see more research on this. And lastly, a study from Amsterdam looked at 203 lupus patients and tracked their uh, prior uh, associations, uh, tracked their... Um, being infected, either with minor infections or major infections, and, and whether or not that influenced minor flares or major flares of lupus. So what they found that there's the incidence of major uh, infections was 6.3 per 100 patient years, I'm sorry, 5.3 per 100 patient years, and of minor infections, 64, so almost 10 or 11 times higher. But that if you had major or minor infections, you had like a, almost a doubling of the lupus flare rate and only did major infections really lead to, and that would be hospitalizable infections, IV, require, IV antibiotic requiring infections, lead to a higher rate of major lupus flares. And that is a 7.4 fold higher rate. That's the hazard ratio, 7.4. Pretty interesting. I like this report that we put up this week on scleroderma, cine scleroderma. Uh, and this is, um, I think it was a report out of, out of JAMA, but uh, a co large cohort of 25,000, almost 25,000 uh, systemic sclerosis patients. And in that cohort that they found 10% um, of patients, and this is actually meta-analysis, I guess, of many studies, right? It's not, no one's got a cohort of 25,000 scar nerves. So many studies um, grouped together. The range in these studies was 0 to 23%. The median was 10%. Uh, incidence of systemic sclerosis sine scleroderma. So you have systemic sclerosis proven by criteria and or biopsy, but they have no sclerodactyly and no skin involvement. So what do they have? 46% had interstitial lung disease, pulmonary artery hypertension in 15%, renal crisis in 5%, and cardiac diastolic dysfunction in 26%. That while this is an interesting subset, how do they behave? Well, they behave more like limited scleroderma than diffuse. And actually, survival was basically equal to that seen in limited systemic sclerosis, right? The crest variant. But was um, certainly a lot better than patients who had diffuse disease. So I don't know about you, but I've seen those patients. And it's good to know have more information about that. You may have seen, I think, the, 
the ULAR report on the ULAR recommendations on the treatment of systemic cirrhosis. I think about 800 of you have read that article. I think it's a good, fast read. Um, Dr. Francesco Delgado from Leeds, he leads the scleroderma research effort at Leeds, um, and he did the presentation on behalf of a 27-member ULAR task force that included 18 rheumatologists, I think, a few methodologists, a few fellows, etc. They sort of uh, looked at the problem of scler uh, scleroderma management according to eight domains. One, rain outs management. Two, digital ulcers. Three, pulmonary hypertension four, skin fibrosis, five, ILD, six, uh, musculoskeletal and joint involvement, seven, GI involvement, and lastly, renal crisis. I think you should look at the report. I have to, if I was going to go over the treatments and they recommend, it would be another 30 minutes, and I don't think you want that. But surprisingly um, interesting placements and good data, a lot of 1A quality evidence, 1B quality evidence for the use of mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, but also rituximab and even tocilizumab and certainly um, nintedinib, okay? Uh, they didn't have perfenidone on this list, but they did have a lot, of, a lot to say about the use of P, uh, PD-5 inhibitors and bosentan and iloprost and uh, IV and others, especially in managing rainouts and digital ulcers. It's a worthwhile quick review. So, um, you can go to look at the table at the bottom of the report that I made for this, or you can read the um, text. And that was a report actually that came out of MedPage today. Um, lastly, you may have seen, I think it was uh, two days ago, that the U.S. News & World Report published yet again the 2024 list of the best hospitals in rheumatology. I listed for you the 20 best hospitals. Um, the top five are really unchanged over the last five years. Um, Johns Hopkins has been at the top of the list for seven years in a row, and the other five spots um, kind of change and move around a little bit. This year, the order was number two, Cleveland Clinic, number three, Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, four, the Brigham in Boston, and lastly, the Mayo in Rochester. I guess all, all Mayos get included in that list. So again, this is kind of exciting stuff. We certainly know that our hospitals... Our medical schools, they love to say that we're the best, that we're on the top of the list. And, you know, um, but, you know, is that where really all the best rheumatologists are? Um, I think in my unofficial review of this perplexing issue that is of such great interest to you that you've listened this far into the podcast, my estimates are that these top 20 hospitals only have about half of the best rheumatologists. The other half um, come from the rest of you. And uh, other stats that I've acquired, one-third of you who are the best rheumatologists have unspeakable, unspellable names. Um, one-quarter of you, strangely, have cats as pets. And at least half of you wouldn't want to be on any such best rheumatology list. Um, so... It's about bragging rights, which seems to be important to universities and academic centers and teaching hospitals and actors. Um, but I don't think rooms, you and I, are so easily impressed by these lists. I think we're glad to say that my institution's on that list. Um, and I think that, you know, all that glitters is not all that great. Um, and that's why I like hanging with rooms who their greatness is achieved at the patient level at each visit every day. Congratulations on all your hard work. That's it for the podcast. Go to the website to check out these citations and more, and we'll talk next week.